John Golia. I'm Greg Fife. And I'm Todd Curtis. And we are the Flight Safety Detectives. Between us, we have over a century of aviation accident investigation and safety experience to draw on as we discuss issues that affect all of us. So we are qualified to share our perspectives on accidents and incidents and what can be learned from them for the future. We're proud to say that we have two sponsors that really relate to the topic of aviation safety. The Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, or PAMA, and Avemco Insurance. Later on in the show, we'll tell you how you can get a 5% discount on your insurance just for listening to the show. We don't just dissect the official reports. In every episode, we identify safety issues and take the mystery out of accident investigations. So maybe pilots in their planes can have safer flights ahead. Well, hello, Todd. Hello, Miles. We have hello, another Kevin. episode of Flight Safety Detectives here and and uh, with our new uh, host, Miles, replacing Greg, <laughs> who's off in a while, blew you under someplace. And, and let's before we go further, let's remind our audience that Miles O'Brien is currently an aviation analyst at CNN and a long history in aviation, including as a pilot and an aircraft owner. So who better to keep us under control? <laughs> well, it's uh, I, I'm I'm not worthy to be with you, gentlemen. Much less, uh, you know, to say I'm replacing Greg is uh, that's not the right word, of course. But uh, it, it is a high honor to be with you. Let's talk about this flight. Uh, let's go back uh, to June 24th, 2023, a dry lake bed not far from Las Vegas. Early hour, what we in the business call the golden hour, when it's best to take pictures. And what are you apt to find out there, gentlemen? Skin. Skin, yep. yes. This is the place where, you know, it's a Vegas thing, as you said, Todd, earlier. <laughs> Uh, photographers will go out there and in that sweet morning light, uh, shoot some scantily clad or maybe not clad at all women on the dry light bed because it's, it's just that sweet light. Uh, and as uh, uh, an individual was doing this, a photographer on the ground, uh, with, I believe, his was it his wife? Is that right? Or a partner? That's correct. The photographer wife. and the model was his wife. Uh, uh, an Aviat Husky swoops into the picture and um there is a quick exchange of conversation and an offer by the pilot to spice up the photography essentially um uh, maybe some clouds of dust maybe some low passes certainly changing the photo shoot in an instant um several a couple of passes occur some pictures are taken and gradually the Abiat Husky gets lower and lower. And on the last pass, the wing dips and horrifically strikes the model in the back of her head. Now, very, uh, you know, you could imagine they all at that moment assumed that was a, a fatal injury, but she did in fact survive, but it was not a pretty in injury. Um, her, obviously a traumatic brain injury and um, other gory details, which we don't need to go into. But one thing I found kind of intriguing about it, she was holding her hand like this uh, as part of the photo shoot with her back to the wing. And so the, the wing hit her like that. And she had a, a kind of a large ring on, uh, which might have actually helped protect her somewhat. But in any case, what you have here is a completely unplanned and yet highly uh, dangerous photo shoot. Uh, just a couple of words that are exchanged, a couple of strangers in the desert, some uh, early morning light and some skin to get. And uh, suddenly um, the photo shoot goes into a completely different direction, which seems intriguing, but ends up uh, being potentially tragic. Um, 
the woman survived. We don't know what happened after that. Uh, but there's so many questions which come out here. And, um, you know, we know anybody, any pilot knows one of the first things you know and learn when you're getting your private pilot certificate is you got to stay a congested area, 1,000 feet above, 2,000 foot diameter around you or radius around you, uncongested areas down to 500 feet. And uh, of course, this would be uncongested. Helicopters have their own set of rules. But anytime, I've done a lot of photo shoot work in my time, filming aircraft to and from aircraft and from the ground and so forth. You really want to spend a lot of time going through that and, and doing a proper briefing and making sure you understand who's going to be doing what and everybody knows the drill. And obviously this didn't happen. So gentlemen, you know, first and foremost, you know, we we could make jokes about Las Vegas. This whole <clears throat> happenstance of being out in the desert in the morning and a plane comes in and there's a photo shoot. Right there, that's an odd event, wouldn't you say? It was not an event for the photographer and, and the model, but not for the pilot because according to uh, the report, this was not the first time he had done this. And in fact, those of you watching the video version of this, I'm flashing a photo not from the actual accident, but from a similar kind of event this pilot had participated in before, where the airplane is dramatically close to um, in the background near the model. And the intent is to have a very close approach and have a very striking picture. This is the kind of thing where, again, Hollywood and big movie studios do this all the time. You're not going to see someone do this with a single person. That is, the person flying the plane is not also the safety monitor and not also the person making sure that the rules are being followed, whatever those rules may be. This was something where it was all on the pilot. There was no one on the ground to wave off the pilot if the plane's getting too close. The pilot had to make these split-second judgments. And he made a judgment, but he wasn't able to pull out in time. So what I look at is a couple of things. One, the nature of the high risk nature of this kind of activity, not something to go into casually. And two, perhaps most importantly, the people he's dealing with. They're out there having fun, having pictures taken. They're not supposed to be experts in the aviation side of things. They can say, oh yeah, that sounds good to us. But as you were just quoting a minute ago, they may not know the regulations. They may not know enough to ask the person, say, are you qualified to do this? Do you have a commercial certificate to do this kind of work or something you can show us other than pictures of your previous uh, forays into this? And uh, they trusted that he knew what he was doing and could do so safely. You know, it's interesting, interesting though, you mentioned pictures, uh, uh, previous pictures. My understanding is that the photographer on the ground uh, later saw some of this previous work and said that if he had seen that, he might not have engaged with this person, interestingly. The, per the picture that we were flashing here a few seconds ago is that picture that was looking dangerous to the photographer. If right. he had had that information, if he had that you know demonstration of what can you do for me lately, he would have said, not today. You know, this is a, a, a case also where you know, we've broken the rules before and got away with it. We're going to do it again. We're going to fly too low. We're going to fly over people. Yes, it makes great photo shoot. But without the support, you're done. Even even with the support, stop and think of the movie accidents that we've had. And they have all kinds of support. And the, the one with the, the Twilight Zone and Vic Morrow, where we killed Vic Morrow and, and a couple of kids, I think. I mean, that's a perfect example. That was a staged event. And it went wrong with lots of people and lots of support around the, that particular pilot. So to do this as a solo entity, uh, big risk, big risk. So the, and clearly there are regulations on the books for this. Um, <clears throat> we all know on, you know, dry lake beds in, in that part of the world, pilots always frequently put it that way, will uh, ignore those regulations. But when you're, and that, you know, it's one thing to skim across the desert on your own and just kind of get that that speed thrill, but to involve other individuals, you would want to, at the very least, spend some time thinking about it. But in theory, you should get a waiver from the FAA, shouldn't you? Yeah. Yes. And they wouldn't give one for a single pilot operation like this. 
No. You know, the first the questions that would be asked to the FAA are just what we said. You know, who, what, when, where, why, and how. And also, we can't forget the insurance aspects of this because even if you were doing this all to the letter, uh, you'd have to have buy off on the, from your insurance uh, provider. Otherwise, you could be in for a world of hurt afterwards. And there's no indication that there was any uh, insurance for this. And certainly, if I had a insurance company with a standard contract <laughs> for most airplanes, and I saw that my client did this with the airplane, I wouldn't pay a dime on any claim. And as you can see from a picture I'm putting up now, this is the damage on the wingtip of the accident aircraft. And the damage doesn't look like it hit someone's head. It looked like it hit something harder than a human body. And you can only imagine a devastation on the victim, uh, given the damage on this aircraft. And also another thing about uh, this accident, which I found intriguing, how do people think in the moment of a near tragedy like this? According to the report or the ancillary documentation, the accident pilot offered to put the victim into the airplane and fly them to a medical facility, but they decided uh, to put her in a car instead. Now, this is an aircraft that had just been involved in an accident. And I know the adrenaline might be pumping and everything, but if you have an aircraft accident of any kind, the last thing you want to do is take the airplane off again for any number of reasons. Yeah, it's uh, well. You, you you can imagine the horror of this, right? It, uh, presumably, you know, uh, they would have assumed she would have been killed instantly. I think we all would have assumed that she was, you know, obviously out of it. A horrible injury in the back of her head, uh, and I don't know what is that presence of mind or is that pure shock? His response. I don't know what you'd call that, Todd or or John. You know, it's the kind of thing you can't. <laughs> Uh, plan out ahead of time. You won't know how you're going to respond to a, a, a one of a kind situation <clears throat> until that one of a kind situation happens. Right, right. Yeah. It, this person was really... not was not unfamiliar with aviation either. The pilot, that is, according to his report, he was actually in an aviation program. He was a mid career person, fifty three years <laughs> old, I believe, and was planning on becoming a professional pilot. Someone who presumably had been spending more than a little bit of time going over the regulations, understanding safety, uh, taking safety courses as a part of that program. And yet that all, uh, I wouldn't say went completely out the window, but there was a clear indication here that this person should have known better. Well, you know, John, you hit on an interesting point. And, and this is, uh, there, there's a, a component of human nature here, which is uh, kind of insidious. And this, this applies to NASA and the Challenger in Columbia, as it does to this case, you do something that isn't properly thought out or dare I say reckless and you get away with it and you make the assumption because you've gotten away with it that you're bulletproof when in fact it's it's no different than playing Russian roulette is what you're doing. Right. I mean, that that's it's, exactly it's, what there's it a trap. There's a trap we get into that we think we're safer than we are because we've made the same risky decision in the past and got away with it. We see that all the time in multiple segments of aviation. We see it with pilots and in accidents. We see it with people on the ground, you know, at, at airports, the mistakes they make. Oh, I always taxi uh, close to the pump so I don't have to drag the hose out. And then one day something happens, inattention, mm -hmm. and he taxis into the pump. You know, it, we see those uh, routinely happening around, and how do, how do you how do you do that? We see it in helicopters often when they're trying to run running on the edge of bad weather, and they're so focused on the bad weather, the ground comes up and hits them. You know, we just had that in in California with the banker in the airplane from Nigeria. I mean, he just kept going at his straight and level, watching the storm, to, trying to scud run to get to his destination. Meanwhile, he's in in elevation that's climbing, and he didn't dive into the ground. The ground came up and caught him. So lack of attention because he's focused on the storm. We, we see those kinds of accidents all the time, tunnel vision uh, from the pilot, and disregarding all the other cues that are, that are available to him. Well, one thing I'd like to, to point out here is one of the statements from the a statement from the accident pilot sort of gives you an idea of his state of mind uh, leading up to this. And I'm going to read directly from the uh, uh, one of the public docket documents from the NTSB accident report. 
Um, this is also on the screen for those of you watching on the video. One idea was to use the airplane to create a wall of dust, quote unquote, as a backdrop. The idea was for me to use the plane's prop to kick up dust where the model would stand between the photographer and the wall of dust. They also wanted a shot where I would take off in the direction of the model so that the photographer can get a shot of the model with the airplane in motion flying. In short, I would take off, get the model and the airplane in one shot, then come back around, land, creating a wall of dust behind me. So this sounds like and it's all, fairly complicated. Of, it's amazing. It, this is a very choreographed thing. And literally all of this on the fly, which is extraordinary when you think about that. But as, as we pointed out, there's a track record here where this individual had done this in the past. I'm curious, Todd, do you have any thought? How could you, I don't think when you learn how to fly, this idea of uh, recognizing uh, your own riskiness is is well inculcated uh, into pilots. You really need to almost objectively look at your actions and 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 have a strict set of your own guidelines of what you should and shouldn't do. And I don't think I'm not sure pilots all pilots do this for some reason. Well, that is part of the standard training for anyone getting a private or commercial or or an instrument rating that you have to look at the human factor side of it, including your human factors as a pilot. But again, this is something where if you don't have someone calling you out on, on foolishness, you can convince yourself that, oh yeah, I can do this. It's like, yeah, I have to do, you know, pylons around a point uh, or, or circles around a point at 500 feet. What the heck? Let me do it at 300 feet because I think it would be more fun to do that. Sure, you're out there alone flying, doing practicing, or in this case, he's doing photography on the fly. And you have no one there to call you out on it. No one there to say, you know what? This is not a good idea. And again, we don't have anything in the background information in this accent to see if this person was doing this on his own all the time. Or is, was he in league with a bunch of other pilots who do this kind of thing, you know, movie style stuff for, for fun and learn from them? It'll be interesting to see if there's a whole community of people who are cruising for a bruising or if he's a one off. Wow, that I, I that would really be upsetting if if that was the case. But that <clears throat> that's a a really good point. This idea of having your um your own sort of kitchen cabinet of aviation advisors, right? You know, the, what we're doing right now is part of you know what uh, I think safe pilots do is we sit here and we we talk about our experiences and we gauge our own you know our various risk profiles, and in doing so, I think we can figure out. Uh, if we're paying attention, what is just plain stupid? And and you're right. Maybe this individual what didn't have a group of of uh, people um, who could you know give him a Dutch uncle if he needed it. You know. You know, and and we often see in some of the commercial crashes involving small airplanes, where other pilots would say they I I would not have flown with the pilot who crashed. You know, after the fact. I would not have flown him because he's a risk taker or whatever the reasons that they have why they wouldn't flown. We have in, in many, many accidents, we would often hear that. And you know, my when I was president of those, I would say, why didn't you say something to somebody? You know, in aviation, we are our brother's keeper. Why didn't you say something, at least to the individual? You know, and that when when they responded to me, the few that did, the answer always was. Uh, they didn't want the confrontation with them. So, I mean, that, and that is a bit of a valid argument if you if you know the individual and he is well one that wouldn't take constructive criticism. I I, I have a confession to make. I um, several years ago I was flying my Cirrus back to uh, Caldwell, and it was a long leg. I don't remember what the point of origin was, but um, you know, I I was the winds were not what they should have been, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I was flying at Lena Peak and and uh, I realized it was going to be really close on fuel. And uh, Caldwell was IFR. And uh, I um, got to the airport and they were vectoring me around uh, to uh, get on to the uh, localizer approach. And uh, I caught a glimpse of the airport, and I so I I canceled IFR and uh, said said that I was um, fuel. Uh, what was the term I used? Uh, fuel critical, I guess. 
and um, and safely landed the airplane. But I landed with, um, I think, only about four or five gallons in the tank. I was not legal. So if the FAA is watching, I hope the statute of limitations, maybe I should fill out a NASA report right now. But yeah, good I, idea. I, I got a call. And this is my point on this is, number one, I immediately realized I'd done a stupid thing, right? And which is good, right? That's good. But I got a call the next morning. Uh, the, the aircraft at the time was in a, a leaseback operation and a fellow pilot of mine, an instructor, went to the airplane and realized, Pumped, put the gas in and realized what what had happened. And he called, he ripped me a new one. And uh, and I thanked him. And I, I I could not have been more thankful that he reinforced uh, the safety lesson, which I should have taken away from that. But that goes to your point. If you're not getting that call, or if you don't even realize it was stupid in the first place, you're going to get hurt. It's just, it's inevitable, right? Yep. Yep. I, and there's no answer to that. I mean, we we see those over and over in accidents. So, you know, there's a list of a, there's a list of maybe 15 or 20 items that we seem to see in far too many accidents as we go through and try to call out events for this show. Well, you know, I could have been it, a statistic. It's all levels. I, yeah, I could have easily been that statistic too. You know, and but it's at all levels. We just did yeah. did one on a, a, a an experimental sports aircraft. Here we are with a regular general aviation aircraft. I've, we've seen it in commercial operations that use, you know, single engine airplanes all the way up to multi-engine aircraft. And this, this, that same thread is in many of them, the risk taking. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I flew on an airplane, the, the charter airplane flying for the U.S. government on the return leg. So I guess it wasn't flying for the U.S. government anymore because it was on the return leg, and uh, and we struggled to get to to uh, Iceland. You know, coming across the pond, the winds again, the winds were wrong, and the, the weather was bad, and and uh, we were having trouble getting to the airport. Uh, so much so that the the raft that was on the airplane, I started to look at it and, and make it unpack easily. Oh, you know, I mean, I I. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't. I didn't think these guys were going to find the airport, oh, but man. fortunately, they did, and uh, and we landed. And I don't know how much was on it. And I've seen other airplanes come in with next to nothing on them, commercial yeah. airplanes, because of of people mistakes. So, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we have the processes that we have. You you said it in the beginning uh, about following the rules. The rules are written in blood. You hear that all the time. So much we hear it that you disregard it anymore. But you gotta, you gotta do your planning for your flight, just like the guy. This guy should have been doing planning on his flying with the model. You gotta do planning for for unexpected events between where you're leaving from and where you're going. You gotta play what if. What if it doesn't go? What if the wind isn't right? What if the weather closes in behind me and in front of me? What am I going to do? You got to think those out ahead. What if I lose an engine on takeoff? This is a good one because we see this over and over again. People run out there, do their run ups, oh, everything's great. Go shooting down the runway and boom, the engine quits. Now, what do you do? Almost always they try to do the impossible turn and come back instead of looking in front of them and putting it down someplace safe. All right, as safe as they can, depending on where your airport is. But You've got to do it. Sully did it. Sully made the assessment immediately when he had those bird strikes. He wasn't going to be able to get back to the airport. And he wasn't, he may have gotten back to the airport, but he risked putting the airplane down over the city. So he said right off the bat, his first transmission will go, might be in the water. What he said. And as things started to unfold, it was in the water. I mean, you've got to plan ahead. And that is a common denominator in so many of the accidents that we try to highlight here and try to share that message with the listeners and the pilots that listen to us is you've got to plan ahead. But it doesn't happen. There wasn't any planning on this one, was there? There was uh, insufficient planning on the spur of the moment. And, you know, one of the things my takeaway from this is 
you know, I chose this accident, not for any particular reason, other than there was a serious injury, it was a final report, and it was a public docket, because I thought, well, gee, whenever there's a public docket, there's going to be extra stuff in there that can really shed light on what's going on. And I'm glad I did. And one of the takeaways I have on this is that this is negatively affecting everyone involved, clearly the person who was injured. And this person's husband, who was part of the planning process, they're going to have psychological and physical scars off of this, as well as the pilot. It's one thing if you do things, you get behind the airplane, you make mistakes, honest mistakes, and you damage the airplane, the FAA is not going to take away your license. This is a situation with a person who, by their own admission, is studying to be a professional pilot that clearly violates the rules. And I think that, as you said earlier, before we said the show, you looked up and see if this airplane had flown since this accident. It has not. I'm wondering if this pilot will fly as a professional pilot ever, or if the FAA will come down like a ton of bricks on him because of the decisions that were made and the actions that were taken and the aftermath. Yeah. Actually, he was 63 years old, Todd. And let's assume he gets his, his commercial instrument by 65. I mean, where's he going to go? Well, he, he could go, you know, he could pursue a charter career, I suppose, or fractional maybe, but I, you know, and, and listen, we, we've all made mistakes in flying and, and some, some have greater consequence than others. And we, and if we're not learning from them, we're not, you know, we're not being good pilots. Maybe he learned, maybe he didn't, but he hasn't flown that aircraft since it happened. For those of you in the audience, if you want to learn from this accident, we're going to make available the accident report and selected documents from the public docket. I highly recommend you read it because there are several angles to this that we didn't cover that you'll probably find fascinating. Okay. Todd, with that, I think we'll let you say the last word. Well, as John reinforce is, what you just said. As, as, as John has famously said over and over again, pre-planning. Whether you're the pilot hours and days ahead of the flight, or whether you're someone who wants to engage the services of someone on the spur of the moment. If you think it sounds like a good idea, but you really like to have more information, get that information. Uh, don't go by whatever someone tells you in the field. Look up that person. Does this person actually have the kind of uh, certificate they say they do? Is this person actually operating with a legitimate company? Has this person done this before? And do you see any evidence of their work or critiques of their work, whether it's Yelp or elsewhere, that allows you to make a decision? Should I get for go forward with this idea or not? And again, whether you're the pilot, whether you're someone associated with the pilot, or you're someone who knows anyone involved in something like this, if you see something that doesn't look right, speak up and say something. And I, would, I would say... Just a word about Las Vegas. It's a city built on gambling. Aviation should never be built on a gamble. Always, always manage your risk. Yes. And my closing, as always, free flight, free planning didn't happen here. Good pre flight on your airplane. We still see lots of problems with that. After you get in the air, Put your head on a swivel because there's a lot of people flying that are inexperienced. They're trying to build time. You don't want to get involved in their accidents. You, so pay attention to what's going on around you. And please, please fly safely. Thank you for checking out our show. We really value our listeners and subscribers. Our podcast gets ranked by you and how much you like it. So please give us five stars in your podcast platform. We want to keep in contact with you. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. You can email the show at flightsafetydetectives at gmail.com. By the way, if you're on YouTube, we're really working on growing the channel, and it helps if you all send in comments. Please do that. And we read all the comments. And be sure to subscribe. Remember, if you're in the market for aviation insurance, you can save 5% with Avemco just by mentioning our show. Visit them at www.avemco.com. That's it for this episode of the Flight Safety Detective. 
Until the next episode, fly safe.